On the night of Sunday, November 25th, 2007, five young men got into a car in Fort Myers, Florida and drove across the state to a small gated community in Palmetto Bay, just south of Miami. There, in the early hours of Monday morning, they broke into a home that they thought was empty. Tragically, they were wrong. 20-year-old Vinjay Hunt, 19-year-old Jason Scott Mitchell, 18-year-old Charles Wardlow, 17-year-old Eric Rivera, and 16-year-old Timothy Brown thought they were gonna score some easy cash. The home they broke into belonged to Washington Redskins safety Sean Taylor, who was home with his girlfriend Jackie Garcia Haley and their 18-month-old daughter. When Taylor was awakened around 1.45 a.m. by the sound of somebody breaking into his house, he told his girlfriend to hide under the blankets with his daughter. He then grabbed a machete he kept next to his bed for protection and went to investigate the woman. As soon as Taylor left the room, Garcia Haley used her cell phone to call 911 and it was right at that moment that she heard a loud noise that sounded like a gunshot. The home invaders didn't expect to encounter Sean Taylor at all, let alone with a machete. 17-year-old Eric Rivera decided it'd be a good idea to bring along a 9mm, and when he was confronted by machete-wielding Taylor, Rivera pulled the gun out and fired two shots. One of those shots missed, and the other did. It struck Sean Taylor in the groin, severing his femoral artery, and as the intruders took off, Taylor collapsed face first on the floor and was quickly engulfed by a pool of his own blood. Jackie Garcia Haley tried to stop the bleeding with a towel, but her efforts were unsuccessful. And roughly 24 hours later, in the early hours of Tuesday, November 27th, Sean Taylor died at the age of 24. Sean Taylor's murder rocked the sports world like few athlete deaths ever have. And the reason for this is that Sean Taylor just wasn't any football player. He was an emerging superstar who was absolutely adored by his fans somebody destined to reinvent his position and become one of the all-time greats. The man was respected by the guys he played with and feared by the guys he played against. And his death was just so utterly senseless, the result of a harebrained burglary gone wrong. Then, to make matters worse, and this is a thing so many people forget about Sean Taylor's death, within hours before police had finished gathering the facts or released any information to the public, jackass sports pundits were firing off hot takes basically blaming Sean Taylor for his own death. Sean Taylor has a history of really, really bad judgment, but Colony cleaned up his act. Just because you clean the rug doesn't mean you get everything out. No joke. They just assume somebody like Taylor, i.e. a young black man who'd had a few run-ins with the law, he must have known his murderer or he must have done something to bring all this on himself. So I wasn't even yeah. surprised, Tony, and that may be the most disturbing yeah, thing. Yeah, I was not other than his condition. because I do, I do know his past. He must have been hanging out with the wrong people. He must have pissed off the wrong person. And the crazy thing is, it wasn't just middle-aged white dudes making these assumptions. Prominent black sports journalists were doing it too. It was absolutely revolting. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but first, Let's take a minute to remember what made Sean Taylor so special. On the run, and he's going to come up short. Oh! Sean Taylor! Sean Taylor was drafted by Washington fifth overall in 2004 out of the University of Miami, where he'd won a BCS championship in 2001 and been named an All-American and the Big East Defensive Player of the Year in 2003. Now, Taylor didn't win the starting free safety job for Washington out of training camp in 2004. But after week two, head coach Joe Gibbs realized he'd made a mistake. And Taylor started every single game he played after that. Over 30 games in his first two seasons, Taylor racked up 120 solo tackles, four forced fumbles, 27 passes defended, and six interceptions for 119 yards. But the numbers only tell a fraction of the Sean Taylor story. What truly made him special was his passion for the game. Taylor was a notoriously ferocious competitor who terrorized the middle of the field and gave his opponents nightmares. Sean Taylor, all he kept telling me is every time you catch the ball, I'm going to try to kill you. <laughs> the dude was 6'2", 230 pounds, and insanely fast. As former Redskins director of player personnel Lewis Riddick once put it, Sean Taylor looked like f***ing Lawrence Taylor at safety. And if you know anything about Lawrence Taylor, that's... That's pretty scary. That's a scary sight. In 2006, just his third year in the league, Taylor made his first Pro Bowl, finishing the season with 111 combined tackles. After the season, Sports Illustrated officially proclaimed him the hardest hitting player in the NFL. And everybody was like, yeah, that sounds about right. In 2007, Sean Taylor went out and had his best season yet, racking up 42 tackles, five interceptions, and nine passes defended in just nine games. At the time of his death on November 27, 2007, 
Most football experts agreed that Taylor had emerged as the best safety in the National Football League, and some already felt he was destined for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. His desire to win was visible every time he stepped on the field, and he never took a playoff. Of course, Sean Taylor did have a reputation for crossing the line. There was his penchant for late, dangerous hits, which earned him lots of flags and fines. And on several occasions, he was alleged to have spit on an opponent. That unsportsmanlike conduct, defense number 21. The word we got is he spit in Pittman's face. The second instance, which occurred in 2005, landed him a $17,000 fine. These instances, along with a couple of legal issues, led a lot of middle-aged sports writers and talking heads to pin the old troubled youth narrative on Sean Taylor. I wasn't surprised because Sean Taylor's been involved in a pattern of things going back to his days at the University of Miami. It also didn't help that Taylor disliked talking to the media and preferred instead to keep to himself. But outside of the media, everybody loved Sean Taylor. Kids playing high school and college football idolized him. They all wanted to be just like him. And in D.C. and his hometown of Miami, Taylor was everybody's favorite player because he was just so damn fun to watch. When Taylor was killed, it was assumed immediately that it was a home invasion gone wrong. The question was whether it was a random event or whether Taylor had been targeted. And as it turned out, Taylor's home had been targeted, but not because of anything Sean Taylor did himself. His home was targeted simply because a bunch of idiots thought they could score some easy cash. You see, one of those idiots, Jason Mitchell, age 19, knew Taylor's half-sister, Sasha Johnson. And Mitchell had attended Sasha's birthday party at Taylor's home a few weeks before the burglary and murder. And at that party, Mitchell saw Taylor give her a purse with $10,000 in cash inside as a birthday present. And so Mitchell got this harebrained idea in his head that Taylor kept a ton of cash around his house. The week before Taylor's death, Mitchell tried to break into the house by himself, but failed. So he recruited 17-year-old Eric Rivera, 20-year-old Vin J. Hunt, 18-year-old Charles Wardlow, and 16-year-old Timothy Brown to help him try it again the following week. According to Eric Rivera, the kid who brought the gun and pulled the trigger, the group of five figured they would find between $100,000 and $200,000 in Sean Taylor's house. On the night of the burglary, the Redskins were in Tampa Bay playing the Bucks. These idiots assumed Taylor was with the team and his house would be empty. That wasn't the case. Of course, as it turned out, Taylor was out with a knee injury that week, so he didn't travel with the Redskins to Tampa. Instead, he spent the weekend in Miami with his girlfriend and his 18-month-old daughter. The house where they lived, the house where Taylor had thrown his party for his sister, the house these idiots thought would contain over 100,000 bucks that wasn't even Sean Taylor's private residence. It was terrible, awful, and shitty luck that conspired to put him and his young family there on the same night some stupid kids thought they'd get rich. Police arrested all five perpetrators within a few weeks of the crime, and they were all charged with first-degree murder. In May of 2008, Ben J. Hunt accepted a plea deal and was sentenced to 29 years in prison. The rest of the defendants managed to get their trials delayed and postponed for years. Finally, in November 2014, gunman Eric Rivera, who was just 17 when he shot and killed Taylor, was found guilty and sentenced to 57 and a half years of prison. Then, the rest of the dominoes began to fall. In June 2014, Jason Scott Mitchell was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. In April 2015, Charles Wardlow was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years of prison. One week later, Timothy Brown pled guilty and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Unfortunately, unbelievably, in the immediate aftermath of Taylor's death, a lot of experts decided they didn't need to wait for the police to provide actual facts before they started pontificating. And this arrogance resulted in a number of nauseating hot takes. ESPN commentator Michael Wilbon said, quote, I've known guys like Taylor all my life, grew up with some. This latest news isn't surprising in the least, not to me. Taylor grew up in a violent world, embraced it, claimed it, loved to run in it, and refused to divorce himself from it. He ain't the first, and he won't be the last, end quote. Fox Sports commentator Jason Whitlock said, quote, no disrespect to Taylor, but he controlled the way he would be remembered by the way he lived." End quote. Washington Post columnist Lynn Shapiro said, people shouldn't rush to judgments based on what they thought they knew about Taylor. Then, in the very next paragraph, he said, quote, Still, could anyone honestly say they never saw this coming? You'd have to be blind not to consider Taylor's checkered past. End quote. The worst of the worst hot takes came from then-ESPN loudmouth Colin Coward 
who cited input from colleagues Stephen A. Smith and Michael Wilbon as evidence that his gut feeling about Sean Taylor's death was correct. Quote, Sean Taylor has a history of really, really bad judgment. Really, really bad judgment. Cops, assault, spitting, DUI. I'm supposed to believe his judgment got significantly better in two years from horrible to fantastic? But Colony cleaned up his act. Just because you clean the rug doesn't mean you get everything out. Sometimes you got stains. Stuff so deep it never ever leaves. My gut feeling with this story, Coward continued, if you have bad judgment for 23 years of your life, even if you clean it up, your judgment doesn't get great overnight. Again, all these horrible takes came within the first few days of Sean Taylor's death. People were making him out to be some type of thug who more or less had it coming. But this thug narrative was just flat out racist bull Yeah, Taylor had a DUI arrest, but what none of these people mentioned was that the charges got thrown out because the cops didn't have just cause to pull him over in the first place. Yeah, Taylor had an assault arrest wherein it was alleged that he pulled a gun on some dude. But what none of these people mentioned was that the victim had stolen Sean Taylor's vehicle or that in the end, prosecutors dropped the part about Taylor pulling a gun. Then there's the stuff about Taylor growing up in a world of crime and violence and that he refused to distance himself from that world, that he actually embraced it. Again, that's more racist bull Sean Taylor went to a private high school. In fact, he went to the same private high school the son of former Florida governor Jeb Bush went to, the same one US Secretary of Labor Alexander Acosta went to. Nobody called these people thugs. Sean Taylor grew up surrounded by crime? Well, that's kind of true because Sean Taylor's dad was a cop and he's still a cop. In fact, he's the chief of police in the Miami suburb of Florida City. Sean Taylor had some maturity issues. He fired some agents, powdered about his rookie contract, skipped out on some meetings, but he wasn't a thug. And the people that actually knew Taylor all said that he'd gotten over his maturity issues, that he was a new person, and that he'd gotten his priorities in order after the birth of his child. And yet people had the nerve to say he had it coming. If Sean Taylor were white, would all these so-called experts have been so quick to assume he was somehow to blame for his own death? No way. 